Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, I thought a, an interesting place to start would be to tell you how I came to be in digital marketing. Um, as John mentioned, I spent the first five years of my career at Ogilvy working on above the line advertising, uh, largely TV, print and radio. And I think the thing which really struck me while I was at Ogilvy was uh, how difficult it is to measure above the line advertising. So you can create great ads. Um, I remember I worked on the GTI ad while I was at Ogilvy, the GTI launch into South Africa. And we had an 18 month waiting list for, for Volkswagen GTIs, but we couldn't really tie that back to our advertising. It was almost impossible to prove that it was necessarily our advertising which had, had created that demand. And I think uh, David Ogilvy said it best when he said he knows 50% of his advertising is working and he just wished he knew which 50% it was. And uh, I think the great thing about digital is that you know exactly which 50% is working and the best part is you can bin the 50% which isn't working and focus all of your energy on the 50% which is. And interestingly, uh, we were having a look at some growth figures yesterday and the strongest growing sector in, in Google's business um, in South Africa is the small business sector. And um, I think when you unpack that, I think it's largely because small businesses are far more accountable to their marketing spend and largely it's the small businesses' money which they're spending and they need to make sure it's working. And I think that's why small businesses are pushing through uh, in a big way. And I think that accountability and, and measurability um, is something which I'd like you to think about throughout what I talk about today. So I'm going to start talking about YouTube. And uh, YouTube's a really exciting product for us in South Africa for a number of reasons. And um, I think the two biggest ones are that we're having massive engagement on YouTube in South Africa. The average South African, uh, when they visit YouTube, spends 16 and a half minutes on it. And um, every month, at least 50% of the online audience in South Africa visits YouTube. And then the second thing is that we're seeing incredible growth. So last year we grew by 190%. So uh, almost three times the view count last year on the previous year. And the previous year was exactly the same. We had almost three times the view count of, of the year before. And you know, I don't know if anyone else's business is growing three times every year, but it's pretty exciting for us that, that, that YouTube is. So I think that's why we see YouTube as, as super important. Um, I was wondering if anyone wanted to hazard a guess at what the total volume of views is around the world on YouTube every day. Any guesses? I have a prize in my bag. I'm not too sure what it is yet, but there's definitely a prize in there. Anyone want to hazard a guess? 20 million? Anyone else? A billion. A billion? It's pretty big. What? A billion. Two billion. Five billion. Okay, so four billion is the actual figure. It's the man on the side there was the closest. But if you think about that figure, that means for every two people on the planet, there's more than one view every day on YouTube. That's a pretty, pretty remarkable number. Um, what that means for um, us in South Africa as, as advertisers and marketers and what it means going forward is that there's huge engagement on YouTube. Anyone want to hazard a guess at how many views Charlie bit? Has anyone watched Charlie bit my finger? It's perhaps the least remarkable video on YouTube, but for some reason it's done remarkably well. Anyone want to hazard a guess at how many views it's got? Okay, well, I'll tell you, it's 440 million, which means that for every, we've got about 2 billion people on the internet, so it means that almost 1 in 4 people on the internet have watched Charlie Bit My Finger, which is fairly remarkable for me. Is that the highest one? Highest no, no, it's, it's not the highest, actually. Yeah. The rest of us are going to watch it. The same. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting, the musicians are doing incredibly well. Like, uh, some of the musicians, like Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber, have got over a billion. Um, really massive. Um, it's not just uh, international Battle of the Kruger. Everyone watched that one? Yeah, it's a great video, 67 million. Nando's Last Dictator, everyone watched this one? Awesome, 1.2 million. I found this one the other day and sometimes videos from South Africa just slip under the radar. The majority of these views didn't come from South Africa, but someone proposed to his, his girlfriend in uh, Santon and she fortunately said yes and it got uh, 800,000 views in, in a really short period of time. Nando's diversity. I think Nando's are one of the most fascinating YouTube brands. In the last three months, this video actually got the most views from South Africans of a South African video. And the reason is that they're just absolute PR masters. I don't know if you saw, but after the DSTV team said that Nando's couldn't, couldn't flight this ad, and then they changed their mind, Nando said they didn't want to flight their ad on DSTV anymore. And um, that's what this little spike down here was. It was an extra 100,000 views off the likes of Biz Community and, and Tenet5 and, and the likes. Um, 
And I think the super interesting thing is, is if you want to get your videos to do super well on YouTube, try and ensure that they get into, into the press. What about the biker? Has everyone seen Buck Norris? Has anyone not seen Buck Norris? What about on big screen? Okay, yeah, because any excuse to show this one. super unlucky. The reason I show that is, um, you know, I think people often think that YouTube videos sit in isolation, but the reality is that any video with over about 10 million views has an entire ecosystem which forms around it. And um, these videos came from South African creators, um, and they basically, the reason that people create these videos is if they do well, they can make uh, money off them essentially. For every million uh, views your own video gets, you get about $3,000 in revenue from, from YouTube. And so these videos are created by people looking to, to monetize them. And uh, this guy got 20,000 views in a pretty quick period of time. Just a quick one, can we turn the, the volume up on the, I think it must be on the amp, does anyone know how to do that? So I'm just thinking it's just a little bit soft, it's full on, full on here. And here another video is from, from Pierce Beast. <laughs> I think it might be a bit better, thank you. And then Zapiro got involved, anything to get on YouTube? Thought that was quite nice, and then I, I loved this one. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd necessarily be showing this if there wasn't a super clever media buy which came with it. And um, what we also find is that when uh, videos like this find their way onto YouTube, uh, some brands and small businesses use this as an opportunity to advertise their, their products. So this is an ad from Capitec, get bucks even quicker and keep an eye on your bucks. I think really awesome, uh, really awesome creative marketing. And um, the reason I think this is a great idea is simply because if you place ads on videos which are new to YouTube and are getting a lot of views, it's really inexpensive. Um, we're talking about 10 Rand cost per thousand, uh, which you can get for, for a thousand impressions. A thousand people to see your ad on the right hand side there, it costs about 10 Rand. The reason it's so inexpensive is because there's not a large volume of people viewing uh, this particular ad because it's, it's new, to, new to YouTube. Um, and an interesting way you can track uh, new videos to YouTube is something called the YouTube Trends Dashboard. And I'm quickly going to show you how it works. So if you want to check this out when you get back to your office, you type in YouTube Trends Dashboard into Google. And what it does is it lists all the videos which are trending in South Africa at any one time. So if you have a look here, we've actually compared videos in South Africa to Ireland, and these are the top trending videos in South Africa at this time. The Buck Norris video was on this system for about, about two weeks. You can see all the videos down here on the left hand side are the ones which are doing well in South Africa at the moment. The next thing I wanted to talk about is innovation within YouTube. And I think um, you know, Google makes all of its money off YouTube from, from advertising revenues. And I think it's interesting to talk about innovation within YouTube and how this is impacting advertisers. Has everyone seen this advertising format called the TrueView ad, which allows you to skip it on the right hand side here? Yes. If you go back a year ago, I'm sure you all would have been really irritated by the ads you couldn't skip. 
You remember that period where we were flighting ads which you had to watch in order to get to the thing you had chosen to watch? And I think what's, uh, we, we got incredible feedback in South Africa. Uh, one marketer I told you actually got, uh, I, I spoke to you actually got emails from people complaining about the ads they were flighting on YouTube. <laughs> so we had to change it. And uh, this little skip button here has been revolutionary for us. And the reason is that advertisers don't pay when the video is skipped and the user has a better experience. So the entire ecosystem does, does better. There was a lot of concern at Google that perhaps if we did this, because advertisers don't pay when users skip the ad, that no one would end up watching the ads. And in fact, we would just lose revenue uh, hand over fist. So we did a few studies. And we thought, let's, let's have a look at uh, testing this over a, a short period of time with a small number of users and see what actually happens. And the way we did it, is we flighted uh, two different types of ads. Um, and we had a look at what the view rate was. And if we found that some videos actually got good view rates, then this would work. If the good ads got good view rates, then there's a case for this sort of system. If the bad ads get bad view rates and so we don't make money, it basically incentivizes us not to flight bad advertising, which I think is, is good for the entire ecosystem. So. The study we did, um, I'd like to sort of do as a, a test in the room today. Uh, so I'm going to fly two ads, and if you could put your hand up when you want me to skip the ad, then, then I'll skip it. As soon as half the room has put their hand up, I'll skip it. You're a nicer audience than most. I'm usually way, way into the skip by now. And I'm going to fly to second one once again. If you get bored, um, stick your hand up. So what we realized from the study is that, um, as I said, great advertising is watched by, by the user and poor advertising isn't. And so we spent a bit of time trying to work out how we could incentivize good advertising to come onto YouTube. And so we built a system where ads which are watched a lot are essentially charged less than ads which aren't watched a lot. And so great advertising um, pays less than poor advertising to be on, on YouTube. And th the system sort of looks after itself because if you are flighting bad ads, sorry, have I, have I written sound here? This is sounding a bit funny here. <laughs> sorry, let me show you what I actually did. It's the one on the far right there. Yeah, it's going to come back a bit. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and, and essentially, it's worked incredibly well for us. Uh, great advertising in South Africa can be receiving uh, cost per view as low as 15 South African cents per view. And poor advertising uh, can be as high as two rand per view. And um, this has done some remarkable things for the advertising landscape in South Africa. We were chatting to the Luries the other day, the Lurie Awards, who uh, award great advertising. And they were just saying how they wished the same system could apply to TV. Imagine if you created a great ad which everyone loved to watch. Should you be paying as much as an ad which people don't necessarily love to watch? I think there's definitely something in that. And that's how the system on, on YouTube works. And another interesting sort of byproduct of this is that the longer an ad's on YouTube for, the lower the view rate becomes because people have seen it before, and so the more advertisers have to pay. And so we found a sort of uh, situation where advertisers only flight the ad for as long as it makes sense to them, which is the same as, as, as it makes sense to the user. So the system's worked really well for us, and we've rolled it out worldwide now. Um, and I wanted to talk about why advertising offers great value for money. So at the moment, I think we'd all have to agree that the time we each have available to receive advertising messages has decreased. We're all busier. We've got Blackberries or iPhones. 
or, or Android devices. And um, so we've all got less time essentially to, to see ads. And at the same time, uh, we'd have to agree, sorry, we'd have to agree that advertising messages have, have increased. Everyone agree if you drive down the road now, there are more billboards than there were last, last year or the, or the year before. And what that does is it means that the effectiveness of push advertising, the advertising you don't necessarily choose to watch, has decreased. And this results in a lot of advertising agencies talking to their clients about trying to break through the clutter, um, trying to get your ad to, to the user in a way where they actually view your ad. And I would argue that breaking through the clutter should be done by the channel, not by the advertising. It's great if the advertising does it as well, but if you have advertising which breaks through the clutter by channel, um, then you don't have to worry about, about the second half. And I'm going to explain how you can do that. Pretty much every, every advertising format Google offers, you only pay for a fully engaged view. So with, with TrueView, for example, someone has to watch the entire ad to the end, which is a, a 30 second, um, or, or for 30 seconds, in order for the, the advertiser to, to have to pay. And that's a pretty, pretty remarkable thing. And what we've, what we've found is that if you, if you have a look at the stats, advertisers are getting remarkable value. So this is just a, a, um, a graph of a typical advertiser in South Africa. And if we have a look at the bottom one here, impressions are views which aren't watched right to the end. So there are 440,000 impressions. 28,000 people watched it right to the end of the ad, or at least 30 seconds. And that's, that's when you pay as the advertiser. The cost for this ad was 77 South African cents. So that's about average for South Africa at the moment. So the total cost for this campaign was 22,000 Rand. And the website clicks were 5,000 or 28,000 engaged views, which is about a 15% click-through rate. I don't know if you've ever run any um, online ad campaigns. Anyone run an online ad, ad campaign? 15% is a almost unheard of click-through rates, and um, certainly is pretty remarkable. So we did some, some studies to, to find out what the ad recall was attached to these ads. Um, any advertising you do, um, if you want to measure them against each other, I think the best way to do it is, is through ad recall. What we found is that if someone watched an ad and still skipped it, there was still a 59% ad recall. If someone watched the entire ad, there was an 81% ad recall. So if you take that thinking back to our table, sorry. What does that mean? So they come back to it? Sorry, um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so ad recall essentially means that after you've watched the ad, you remember having seen it. So we interviewed, well, we watched the viewing habits of 1,600 people. And at the end of it, we said, do you, do you remember seeing this ad while you were viewing YouTube? And if they said yes, that's what we regard as an ad recall. And that's pretty much how most above-the-line advertising is measured. So then if you take those stats back to our slide over here, we had 440,000 people who viewed the ad but, but uh, didn't view it to the end. So if you subtract the 28,000 who did watch it, it's 415,000 people who skipped the ad at a 59% ad recall rate, which means that 244,000 people would remember seeing the ad from the initial impression. There'd be 28,000 people who viewed the entire ad at an 81% at an ad recall rate, which means that 23,000 people would remember. So if we added this together, you'd get 26, sorry, 268,000 people who, view, who remember seeing the ad for a cost of 22,000 Rand. And coming from an above-the-line advertising background, you'd probably be talking in the millions to get 260,000 people to remember seeing your ad. So I think in terms, of, um, in terms of value, this system really has worked very well for us. And if you work out what the actual cost per individual ad recall, it came out at 8.3 cents. So this is just one, um, one example, but I think it's pretty representative of what you would hope to achieve in South Africa. And, um, certainly is really exciting for us. So I started saying that uh, David Ogilvy uh, said that he knew 50% of his advertising was working and he just wished he knew which 50% it was. And I think uh, David would love digital and would love YouTube in particular because um, you know exactly which 50% is working and you can bin the 50% which, isn't, which isn't. Any questions on YouTube while I, while I move on to uh, the other parts of our business? Yeah. Um, I work in an organization that doesn't allow employees to spend most of their day in the office and yeah. 
Yeah, um, a lot of organizations uh, do have that rule in place. Um, I think the interesting thing is if, you, if you're asking from an advertising point of view, um, because you pay a cost per view, we're only worried about the people who do end up on YouTube at the end of all of the rules and, and low bandwidth, etc. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, you're right. I think a lot of the organizations we speak to do have those rules in place. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, our search business, um, and I'm sure everyone in the room has, has done at least one search on Google. I, I would hope so anyway. Um, Google's um, entire business model from the start came specifically from Google search. And the fascinating thing about Google search is having a look at what made it so particularly successful. Um, if you're advertising online, our sort of philosophy is that you build an online branding platform. So you build a website or a Facebook page or a YouTube channel. And then you need to drive relevant traffic to that, cha to that channel or, or to the web, the web page. And when you're driving that traffic, there are two core things you need to think about. You need to think about relevance, which we'll put on the, the x-axis. And you need to think about cost, which we'll put on the y-axis. And what you want is the highest possible relevance, so the furthest to the right-hand side here, at the lowest possible cost. So you want to be right down here. Um, if you can get your traffic to your website, which comes from this bottom, bottom corner here, then you're ensuring that, that, that you're doing the best you can as an advertiser. So I was at Unilever the other day, and I thought this would be a good example to show how this works. Robertson's business focuses on recipes. If you go to their websites, their entire strategy online is to provide useful recipes to their, their users. So if I was to define the perfect visitor to this website, it would be someone who didn't cost a lot, who was specifically looking for recipes. Everyone in agreement? So if we have a look, um, and anyone can access this, uh, it's called the Google Keyword Tool, and it tells you how many people are searching for any one term on the internet. So here we can see that the local monthly searches in South Africa for curry recipe, they're 18,000 every month, and the cost is 160 per click on average. The term recipe, they're 820,000 searches every month in South Africa alone, and it's about two rand. Milk tart recipe, they're 2,000 searches, and it's about 80 cents. So what you can see is that there's a large volume of highly relevant search queries, and relative to a lot of advertising mediums, Anything in the, the one, one to two rand region for a highly engaged user in, in your, end, your end product um, would be regarded as, as, as pretty low cost. I've got mobile here as well. Interesting to see that we get 165,000 search queries on mobiles in South Africa, and it's about one rand 58. So if I was to go back to that, uh, that graph, um, we would argue that Google search provides the most relevant possible traffic to your website at the lowest possible cost you're going to find. And this is exactly why Google has done so well globally, um, because they offer relevant, fairly low cost traffic. And um, that's sort of the, the core to it. I wanted to speak next about um, a product of ours called the Google Display Network. And um, has anyone ever heard of the Google Display Network? OK, so, so one. The Google Display Network Essentially, if you build yourself a website um, and you create useful content, that's kind of tricky in itself. To then go out and sell advertising space on that website, especially when it's small, is near to impossible, um, unless you've got a specifically niche website. What you can do is you can place one line of code on your website, and then Google puts ads on your website for you on behalf of their clients. And that makes sense. OK, fantastic. So if you search chicken curry recipe, for example, every one of these circled websites are part of the Google Display Network. They are flighting Google Display advertising. So if, for example, you go to the first one, which is 101 Cookbooks, this ad here is a Groupon ad, which was flighted through the Google Display Network. This ad here on allrecipes.com uh, came through the Google Display Network. This ad here on the Telegraph, um, we, uh, there's a lot of traffic in South Africa to the Telegraph, and um, this, is, this is one of the ways you can place advertising on it through the Google Display Network. That, that makes sense. Everyone understand what the, what the platform is. Fantastic. So if we go back to um, our chart here, I would argue that it's probably slightly less relevant because you haven't answered a specific search query, but you're on the page which that person has landed on off the back of the search query, so it still is highly relevant. And the cost 
is incredibly low. We're talking in the re region of 8 Rand cost per thousand views, um, which is r remarkably low, um, specifically given how, how relevant it is. So I think if you, if you have a look at, at uh, Google's success in this space, um, I'll go back to it again. The, the reason that, that Google's been highly successful over the last few years is that um, they're using highly relevant advertising at a really low cost. I think the next thing I, I thought would be super useful to talk about is the insights you can glean for your businesses from Google search results. So when I, when I joined Google, I remember, yeah. Mm. Really good question. Um, so the, the interesting thing about the Google Display Network, I always say if you've thought of an idea around how to use it from a targeting point of view, someone at Google has thought about it as well and has put it in place. So if you want to target just the Telegraph, just on that page, you can. If you want to make it a bit sort of less um, involved from your side, you can say any website which talks about chicken curry, I want to have my ad on. Or any website which talks about um, the latest review between the Golf GTI and the BMW M1, for example. Um, so you can choose based on keywords, you can choose based on sites, you can choose based on specific pages. Pretty much any type of targeting you can think of has, has been put in place. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No, another great question. <laughs> um, so Zando is an incredibly aggressive business. Has everyone heard of Zando in South Africa? Has everyone seen them on the internet? It's it's remarkable. So Zando, a couple of months ago, didn't exist. They were a um, they're actually a, a German company who looked at South Africa and said, no one's doing this. Certainly no one's doing it properly. You can't buy clothes online. If you go to the UK, there are at least 10 companies who are offering really comprehensive products in that regard. So Zando brought out that model and said, let's, let's see how it can work. Um, Zando are incredibly aggressive in how much they, they invest in the, in the internet. Um, they track down to every, from every ad they place all the way through to the shoe they sell or the, or the, or the shirt that they sell. And um, they're investing massively on the internet at the moment because it's working for them. Interestingly, um, now that you've asked, I'll, I'll explain one other product of the Google Display Network. I visited the Xander website about three days before I took the screen grab. Um, you can use the Google Display Network to flight ads to people who have visited your website in the past. And that, that's how this ad is here. And in fact, these guys are so sophisticated, these are the shoes that I was looking to buy. The, this, not this one, it was actually that one. <laughs> But um, I mean, that's the level of targeting you can look at. And um, I actually checked out, didn't buy this, size, this shoe because it didn't have a 10 and a half. And um, once I'd searched for that, they realized you don't, that they don't have a 10 and a half, they stopped flighting the ad to you. It's an incredibly sophisticated system. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, and that's, you're the best question answer, you definitely ask it. Uh, so up here, we've just launched a system where if you don't like the ad, you can just, there's, there's a cross at the top of all the ads now, you can just click the cross and it'll stop, it'll stop being flighted to you. Um, if you choose that you don't want to have ads flighted to you based on where you used to, where you have visited in the past, um, you can go to Google forward slash ads forward slash preferences and choose what ads you want to see. Uh, we believe that in, in sort of five years time, everyone in this room will be choosing the ads they want to see because ads can be super useful. They can be the answers to the questions which are, which are burning in your mind. You know, if you're looking for a new, a new golf and you visited the, the VW website, you're probably going to be interested to see the latest VW finance plan. I mean, it makes sense that you probably are. So you can choose specifically to see automotive um, ads if you're looking for a car at this, at this time. And you can do that at the moment. In the US, we've got about a 30% rate of people doing that. In South Africa, it's still fairly low, but it will increase, yeah. Forward slash preferences. Yeah, and you, you'll see what we have um, as a profile for you within our advertising system. So if you visit a lot of sports sites, you'll see sports there. You'll be happy to hear that nothing which is um, on the iffy side of what you should be looking at on the internet will be included on that list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's cookie-based, it's on the browser. Um, 
you know, there's a lot more cookie-based stuff going on than, than, than you might think. You know, if every time you visit a website, if they're tracking the activity on the website, they place cookies on your browser to see what you're doing on their website. Um, there's a lot of interesting debate around the, the legality and whether that should be happening in the U.S. And um, we tend to sort of follow, follow whatever um, sort of principles they put out there. But it makes the Internet far more useful for everyone. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, we would only, so it becomes your list. All the people who visited your website, um, you just get a list which is anonymized, so you don't see who's in that list. Um, you just have a list of, of a volume of people, and you could then say, I want to flight my ad to all those people who visited my site. And that's your list. No one else can, can use the people who visited your site to advertise to you. Cool. So when I, when I joined Google, someone said to me, the, the best thing about joining Google, surely, is all of the useful data you get access to. And I couldn't agree more. Um, the fascinating thing is that Google opens this data up to everybody. Uh, any um, of the super useful search query data, which I'm going to show you now, is available to anybody. So I'm going to ask you a few questions about what search volumes could tell you about the economy. So for example, do you agree that ski holidays are a fairly useful economic indicator um, around the world? So the volume of people searching for ski holidays probably tells us something about the economy. Agreed? Certainly could infer something. You can see ski holidays off an index of 100 back in 2006 and 2007. And the 2011 holidays went down to about 40% of where it was. What do you think jobs have done? Up or down? Up. 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 Okay. Okay. So yeah, you can see from probably around 70% in 2006 up to a sort of peak around about now. What about Tiffany's? This is always an interesting one. You know, the lipstick theory or down. Okay, it is down. We get a lot of apps for this one, but you can see here it's also at about 40% of what it was back in 2006. So what about um, this question? What can search volumes tell us about the seasonality of promiscuous sex? Any, any ideas? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so you can see that the morning after pull peaks every single Sunday of every single weekend of the year. It's always a Sunday. <laughs> and you can see that January the 1st is always, every year, the biggest day for morning after pull around the world. And let's look at correlations. What do you think might correlate to this? What about hangover cure, perhaps? Hangover cure is always a Sunday. You can see there's, there's Saturday's big, but it's, it's always a Sunday. And who's in the lead with hangover cure? The Irish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the way this works, this part down here, is that essentially what it does is it indexes um, the search query hangover cure as a percentage of all search queries in a specific region. And Ireland has the most hangover cure search queries as a percentage of all of their searches. Second is the United Kingdom, then the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Interesting that South Africa didn't make that, that graph because we do in a lot of places. <laughs> and what you can also see here is hangover cure also spikes on Christmas every, every year. Okay, so what could search queries tell us about... Um, uh, let me actually rewind a bit. Does everyone sort of understand how this works? So this is just an index on the right-hand side here. And this one is specific years leading up to, to this year. Anyone want to hazard a guess at how search volumes could help you pick stocks? Any, any ideas? No ideas, OK. And I'll, go, I'll go right on to it then. So here's a graph of search queries for Sony versus Samsung. And you can see from all the way back in 2004, Sony's been a key leader. But somewhere in the middle of 2010, yeah, Samsung took a massive leap forward. And if you look now, there's been a massive, a massive shift in the search query volumes for each, each stock. I mean, sorry, not for each stock, but for each brand. This is from Google Finance and is a graph of their share price. And what you can see is somewhere in the middle of 2010 here, there was a shift from Samsung becoming more, um, having a greater share price than, than Sony, which had traditionally always had a greater share price. So I'm not suggesting you go and choose which stock to buy <laughs> off the back of, of these graphs, but they absolutely can give you guidance. So you know, if you think about the, the thinking here, if more people are searching for Sony phones or Sony new products than new Samsung products, and you can see that there's a trend, I think we have to agree that if, let, let's sort of go micro. If a lot of people are searching for the new Canon 
D40 camera, and that's their core product, you could assume that that perhaps would have an, an implication on their, on their share price. And if you sort of put them next door to each other, that's pretty, it's pretty accurate. You know, it's pretty much the same time of year. I would say that the, share, the, the search volumes just happened a little bit earlier. Okay, this one's another fascinating one. What search volumes can tell us about family priorities? So I'm looking at two search queries here, conceive a boy versus conceive a girl. And what you can see is that around the world, there's definitely a stronger volume of search queries for conceive a boy and for conceive a girl. But something happened at about the end of 2010, which made conceive a boy far stronger than conceive a girl. And I was trying to work out what this is. And I think what it is, is that a lot of third world countries have, have recently come onto the internet. So if you have a look at a country like Kenya, so this specifically looks at Kenya, the search query conceive a girl doesn't even exist in Kenya, it's just conceive a boy. And what happened in about the end of 2010 is lots of third world countries, this is my own um, hypothesizing if that's the right word. Um, so this, th th but, but I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, if you have a look at India, if you have a look at China, a lot of these markets have pushed a lot more people onto the, onto the internet over the last two years. And over this period, if you go back to here, you can see that conceive a boy had a, a real significant leap um, around about that time. Interestingly, this isn't, um, okay, so South Africa, we're talking an index of 55 versus 29 for Conceiver Boy versus Conceiver Girl. If you have a look at Australia, Conceiver Girl is actually ahead. And if you have a look at the majority of the first world countries, Conceiver Girl has become more important than Conceiver Boy. So if you have a look here, South Africa, 100 to 68. Australia, Conceiver Girl is ahead. Ireland, Conceiver Girl is ahead. New Zealand, Conceiver Boy is slightly. United Kingdom. But I, I'm not entirely sure what this data is necessarily going to be used for, but it's super interesting. I think you'd, you'd have to agree. Okay, this is the final one I want to show you before I make some volume of sense of, of, of all of this and how it could influence your business decisions. So what about the organizational skills of girls versus boys? So this is gifts for boyfriend versus gifts for girlfriend. And you can see that there are twice as many search queries <laughs> for gifts for, for, gift for boyfriend versus gifts for girlfriend. And if we go a little bit closer and we, we sort of narrow it down, so this is over a monthly period, the blue line is gifts for boyfriends, so obviously girls searching this. And what you can see is that girls start searching quite a lot earlier than boys. <laughs> <laughs> what you can also see is that girls peak over here, so it's about the second week of December. Boys are basically searching to the day of Christmas. <laughs> right. and, and, and the most remarkable part of it all, as soon as you get married, it switches around. Gifts for wife is greater than gifts for husband. <laughs> Just drilling in one, one little bit more. Um, interestingly, gifts for husband um, is the blue line. And you can see gifts for husband around Valentine's Day is greater than gifts for wife. Anyone have an idea why that might be? Yeah, you know, exactly, because guys know it's flowers. It's, it's, not, it's not too tricky. Flowers and a, and a dinner, but, but I suppose for girls it's a bit harder. Any questions about, about search and search volumes? Um, so let's talk about some ideas how this could be super useful for your business. Let's say you're about to launch an advertising campaign and you want to decide whether to advertise the fuel efficiency of your car, uh, the fuel consumption of your car, or the environmentally friendliness of your car. They're the same thing. If your car is low in fuel efficiency, um, or high in fuel efficiency, should I call it, then it's probably not going to have that much impact on the environment. So it's the same sort of thing. Brands often use each, e either one of those to decide how to position, position their, new, their new car they're selling. Um, if you had a look at the search volumes and you saw that the search volumes for fuel efficiency were far greater than the environmental impact of a car, then you could choose that that's the way you should advertise. Um, another idea, if for example you're running a cooking school, a small business cooking school, and you want to see which recipes you should be teaching your class. Come and have a look at which recipes are, uh, are most used on here. So Google Insights for Search is where you search for these. Um, it's available to anyone. And Google Insights. Insights for Search. Google Insights for Search. And um, once you've seen these results, you can then go to the keyword tool, which I showed you earlier, to get actual numbers each, each month in South Africa. Any questions about this? Okay. John, what time? Nine, it's, it's over at nine here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so I wanted to talk about what's next at Google. Um, Google is a fascinating company with, with perhaps the most innovative culture of, of any business in the world, arguably. And um, has anyone seen these? These are called Google Glasses. Anyone? No. You have? Okay. So this is a remarkable project. You know, Google hasn't, um, I wouldn't say, done anything massive to the, the technolo technological landscape um, for quite some time, but I think this is, is truly remarkable. So this is basically, um, that's a screen which you can see, and the thing on the side there is actually um, pretty much has the same functionality as a phone. I'll show you a quick video of how this would work. I'm going to pause it there because of time. Um, but how, how remarkable, you know, um, just to give you a sense of how that works, we, the, the product, I was about to say we've put, but I've got nothing to do with this. The product's uh, got a compass in it, it's got an accelerometer, it's got a gyroscope. So wherever you look, the phone knows that that's where you're looking. When we launched the product, um, there was a lot of negativity in the press. Like, come on guys, this is, this is like a, a blue sky project, it's not going to work. So. Um, at a conference a month ago, we decided to prove that it would work. And I um, thought we'd put it to the, the greatest test that we possibly could. So our, our founder on the left hand side. We're going to do, do something pretty magical here, and we have a special surprise for you. We've got something pretty special for you. It's a little bit time sensitive, so I apologize for interrupting. Um, You've seen some really compelling demos here. They were slick, they were robust. Uh, this is going to be nothing like that. This can go wrong in about 500 different ways. So tell me now, who wants to see a demo of that? So, so we've been really excited to test this for a few months. The unit I actually really want to show you uh, I lent to a friend, and, and he's going to be here momentarily. Uh, my friend is JP. He does a lot of skiing, base jumping, wingsuiting, all sorts of crazy things. And uh, he's actually pretty close by. He's just about a mile overhead right now with his buddies. Um, they have two glass units. If you can, guys can maybe afford to wait that couple minutes. Make no bring that. Guys, I'm going to fast forward. This is the guys in the, in, the, in the blimp, and they've all got a pair of these on. So they're going to basically skydive with a pair of Google Glasses on. So this is one of the things that we've been uh, experimenting with last, just the ability to really share. And we posted some pictures, but as we start to experiment, being able to share what you're seeing live is really amazing. And you know, we're not, we don't know what's going to happen here. I, you know, these guys are all really good. They're trained and uh, have great confidence. But this is. Uh, 
Every one of the screens at the bottom here is, is a real-time feed into a video conference. So, and it's straight off the, the, the video on the front of the glasses here. So these are all the skydivers' views at the moment. And um, this is using something called Google Hangouts, which is a video conference for numerous different feeds. But um, I think as a way to show the robustness of, of the product, um, they, they used this. And, and how remarkable that there's a product which actually can do this today. Um, you know, he's actually talking now. If, if you could hear him, he's talking to the guy on the stage while he's got his sheets open off, off, his, off his glasses, and it's a truly remarkable, truly remarkable thing. Uh, I preloaded. <laughs> yeah, but come to our office. We've got super fast internet. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. Should I? Should we can turn it on? Yeah. Um, oh, you mean with their eyes? Are you gonna have to speak to Sergey, our, our founder, but it works. <laughs> no, it, I mean it's pretty remarkable, you know, and and. Uh, a lot of people are like, Jono, this is definitely not going to take off. I mean, who's, who's going to walk around with a pair of these? But if you think you're driving somewhere and you want to make phone calls and you want to navigate and you want to uh, perhaps uh, do, do text messages, this is, this is a great way to, to, be, to be able to do all those things. But um, we handed out a thousand of these to everyone who attended this conference. This guy literally... Uh, uh, looks like we've... Yeah, so they landed and they, they literally uh, drove the glasses in and then they handed out a thousand to everyone at this, at this event. Is that been happening here today? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, and then one final thing. Um, so Google, um, I think one of the, the greatest things about Google, as I said earlier, is this innovation and technology, technological advancement which Google focuses a lot of its energy on. I remember seeing a, a shareholder's um, letter saying that we're not, um, as a business, going to stop innovating. Um, we're not going to stop investing in big, big products because of shareholder demand. The, the idea of Google is to continue to innovate so that there's um, new lifeblood to revenue streams, essentially. Um, and I thought this was a super interesting example of innovation and how different parts of Google can come together. Has anyone ever used the speech recognition software on, on mobile phones for Google? Um, so you can... Now, if I pick my phone up, it's, it's actually in my bag, I can press one button and speak in the search query I want to search on Google, and it takes that little sound bite, fires it out to the cloud, brings back a search result, uh, brings back what I had, uh, had meant to say, and then searches for that. It's incredibly powerful, and I can show you on my phone afterwards. Uh, we've indexed South African English um, so that it understands South African accents. We've indexed Afrikaans, and we've indexed Zulu as well. So if you want to do your search queries in Zulu and you want to speak them into a, into a phone, it, it works. Um, so what the, the YouTube team realized when they spoke to the speech recognition team is we could just place the same software on top of the YouTube platform. And what that would allow us to do is do real-time subtitles of, of what's being said by any English, English, uh, English video on YouTube. So this is real-time um, subtitles of what this guy's saying. So then the Translate team, everyone used Google Translate at some stage. So the Google Translate team spoke to the speech recognition team and they realized that you could perhaps overlay Afrikaans onto this. So if you click Translate Captions, Afrikaans comes up. 
Press OK. And what happens is you get real-time Afrikaans translations of any English video on YouTube. And I think where this becomes super exciting is when uh, Google fully understands the Chinese language, for example, and can give you real-time English translations of what's being said in, in, in Chinese. But that's the last thing from me, guys. Thank you very much for, for, for your attention. Any questions before I shut down? <laughs> um, so apparently they're shipping about mid next year. At the moment, um, a thousand were handed out, and th those guys are basically testing them at the moment. So yeah. Who made the um, I'm actually not too sure, but it was all very sort of hush hush and secretive. So it would have been um, an internal Google project. So with yeah. To your ads, um, the, the setup looks as though it's um, ideal for retail type environment as yeah. opposed to corporate or wholesale. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you find any, any trends or have you got something to so try like to back it up or support? Could you give me an example of a business? Uh, our business uh, support provides um, a strategy and uh, uh, assistance in distressed organizations. Okay. Um, which you, you're really looking for business people to yeah. to pick up that as opposed to yeah. your, your typical retail type clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... Um, I would argue that there's search queries for pretty much anything you can think of. Use the keyword <laughs> tool and you can just navigate around there. Try different search queries. Try distressed business. Try um, loan defaults, business loan defaults. Search for those sorts of queries. You'll find a remarkable number of them. Um, I'm not, it's not going to be in the hundreds of thousands, but you only need one for it to be worthwhile and you only pay per click. So you know, if there are 10,000 and you get 50 to click on your ad and it's three rand, 10 converted, sort of, it's good business practice. Cool. Thanks very much, everyone.